Hello, OIS podcast audience. Uh, nice to speak with you again. My name is Rob Rothman. For those of you who don't uh, know me, I am a clinically practicing ophthalmologist. Uh, I am a glaucoma specialist by training. I spend about 50% of my time uh, in that capacity. And the rest of my time I spend as a co-founder and co-managing member of InFocus Capital Partners, which is an life science venture capital fund focusing exclusively on ophthalmology. Uh, we have uh, completed the investment cycle for our fund one and are currently in preparation uh, for the launch of fund two. Um, it is my privilege to speak with uh, someone who I've gotten to know a little bit over the past few years since the last time we spoke. Today's guest is Brian Cully, who is the CEO of Lineage Cell Therapeutics. And we actually had the opportunity to speak right, I think, at the beginning or right before COVID hit where we were speaking um, on another platform about the progress at Lineage, and a lot has happened since that time. Thanks for taking the time today. Well, thanks very much, Rob. I'm happy to be here. Join Drs. Maria Barakal, Praveen Dougal, and Faras Rahal at the upcoming OIS Retina on July 27th in Seattle, where you'll see and meet with leading startup companies, top industry executives, and clinical thought leaders addressing unmet retina needs through novel therapies. Save 30% when you register for both OIS Retina and OIS 13, the original Ophthalmology Innovation Summit, taking place this December 1st and 2nd in San Diego. Register today at OIS.net. Net. I think that there's a lot to um, uh, to cover today. To the audience, I want to apologize a little bit in advance. I have uh, the worst allergies I have ever had in my entire life. And I probably sound horrible, but despite a whole litany of mostly legal drugs, I am absolutely incapable of, of breaking out of this horrific allergy cycle. So um, sorry in advance. Um Brian, I want to just spend a couple of minutes, um, and I think it's something useful for the audience to just know a little bit about your background, because there's a lot of exciting stuff to talk about at Lineage, but I thought I want to spend a little bit of time focusing on you, because you've really been driving this process, you know, all along, and I think a lot of the success of, of what's happened, you know, at Lineage is is, is due to your experience in, in steerage. So just tell a little bit about your background, maybe, you know, where you were before and how you ended up at, at Lineage. Um, I'm happy to. I, it it probably is best characterized by diversity. Uh, I mean, I've spent many years wearing a white lab coat, you know, trying to find new drugs. Um, but I also did tours of duty and technology licensing for UC San Diego. I used to be a business development professional, you know, buying and selling drug assets for uh, for different companies. Um, for about 15 years, though, now I have been uh, the CEO of publicly traded uh, biotech companies. This is my third one, uh, but I really, I really strive hard, and I find it very productive to rely on my background in molecular, cellular, and developmental biology, and then my experience in the in the capital markets, and then just trying to learn organizational behavior on the fly in order to you know build successful companies. So you know, pulling both the science and the business together. And, and sort of the most rational and, and productive way has been incredibly exciting because ultimately, you know, it's about trying to develop new therapies to help people. And, and that's what drives me and motivates me. You know, it's interesting. And I've made this comment before, but I, I often find that uh, many successful companies in ophthalmology have people who um, are running them who have these diverse backgrounds in multiple aspects of, of the pharma world, right? You know, um, you know, licensing, uh, you know, it's a big deal, right? Understanding how to uh, acquire assets is a big deal. Understanding the science is obviously, you know, critical, especially when you're dealing with the type of technology that you're dealing with. So um, I, I think it's important people to know for people to know that you're not just a, a finance guy, you know, sitting at the top of a company that's got some very disruptive and exciting technology for, for ophthalmology patients but that there's a story behind there, which is sort of um, gives you the ability to look at, you know, what your company's done and where it's going from multiple perspectives. And I think that's part of the reason that it's moving in the right direction, but um, not a lot of people know that. Why don't you tell everybody sort of about lineage and what you guys do? Cause you know, the audience is kind of diverse on these podcasts and I think people should really understand, you know, what you are, your fundamental um, technology um, 
uh, where it came from and 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 where you're at. But don't get into the good stuff yet. <laughs> no problem. Just give the yeah, save the good stuff. Just do the background <laughs> stuff. So uh, at its core, Lineage Cell Therapeutics uh, is a company that's engaged in the the business of manufacturing specific types of cells of the human body and then using them as as transplants in what we call replace and restore. So there are different disease settings, which we'll cover today, where a specific cell type is dysfunctional or maybe it's been lost entirely. And we have figured out how to manufacture those specific cell types. And we, you know, essentially just squirt them into people. And as long as the cells are, are viable and, uh, and functional and they're not rejected, uh, we've seen indications that you can bring recovery, you can restore activity for that type of cell uh, in ways that, you know, appear to go beyond what small molecules and antibodies are capable of doing in, in certain settings. So this is not, I mean, it's complicated. So it's great that you sort of brought it, you know, to a sort of a fundamental level, but, you know, a lot of people will come into a physician's office and when they're given a diagnosis of a certain disease, especially something that's, you know, progressive and potentially incurable. So in my world, it's, you know, more glaucoma than anything else, you know, probably one of the first three questions that comes out of their mouth is, well, what about stem cell therapy? Right. The whole world knows stem cell therapy. Mm -hmm. So if somebody asks about that. I mean, is the is the answer say, hey, look up lineage cell therapeutics? I mean, is this is stem cell therapy to some in some regard, right? I mean, uh, I yeah, I, except I hate that. Um, I know that's why even, I asked. Right? Too, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? It's, it's such a great question. So the the history of stem cell therapy has been at best, I'm being generous, mixed. Um, it's mostly been failure. And our view is that that's because using undifferentiated stem cells, uh, especially in the eye, uh, has not led to you know wonderful results. Uh, so what we do is is different. Um, yes, I acknowledge that we begin with stem cells. However, we change them into the actual specific and differentiated cell type that performs the function in the body. So um, I don't really know if you squirt a bunch of stem cells into someone's bloodstream, can it, you know, go find the cancer and kill the cancer? I don't know. Um, but we do know that you can uh, use T cells in a way to destroy a, a, a tumor. So um, what we do is, is based at its foundation in stem cells because stem cells have these wonderful property of being able to expand or multiply without changing many, many times over. So we have an unlimited supply of starting material but just like flour can lead to a cookie or can lead to bread and you do different things with cookies and bread, we do different things with the 200 different cell types of the human body. So if we need retina cells, we don't use stem cells in the eye, we use retina cells. So it's, it's a lot more, our technology is far more similar to a bone marrow transplant, a successful technology that's been around for 60, 70 years, uh, than it is to stem cell technology. So we, we try to really make that distinction that we don't put undifferentiated stem cells into the human body. We can't even detect undifferentiated stem cells in our clinical material. We do a full transformation of those cells into a different cell type, and then we use that cell type as the medicine. Right. So they're indication specific stem cells is sort of, you know, what I, when, when, when a patient will ask me and they'll say, Hey, what, what, you know, I read that some guy somewhere, you know, some clinician in some state is doing stem cell therapy for glaucoma. I'm like, yeah, I don't really know what that means because there's really no stem cell therapy for glaucoma. And then you find out, you know, that patients are going down there, they're basically having their blood spun. It's an autologous, you know, and they're basically injecting, you know, platelet rich plasma, which they're calling stem cells somewhere. And of course, it's not going to be beneficial, you know, except for a placebo effect and whatnot. And I think that there's a lot of, um, you know, maybe it's bad press, I would like to call it, right? I think you've mm -hmm. heard about all these people that have capitalized on the language of stem cell therapy, because there is a, a lot of potential in that space, but it takes something um, highly specific, highly differentiated and, and properly delivered in order to have an effect, right? I mean, that's the bottom line. 
yeah, there are some bad actors in that space that are taking advantage of a desperate patient population. It's extremely sad. In some cases, it's criminal. Um, there are probably a handful of folks who are really trying to answer the question, can undifferentiated stem cells help in, in different disease setting? And I, I hope they get those answers. But if those answers are no, they don't do anything. You know, that whole, that whole area of our field needs to just go away. Um, so yeah, we we really try and make a distinction to separate ourselves. Uh, you know, we're we're not gonna we're not gonna make an endothelial a corneal endothelial cell to treat cancer, right? right? But you could use it for something else, and and that really is our approach: specific cell types and only specific cell types. Right, I, I, and and again, I think it, you know you'll you maybe you maybe can share a little bit about the science involved here for for the audience that that understands the science to some degree. I think it's worthwhile telling people you know a little bit more about how your technology is differentiated from other um, potential, let's say, stem cell therapies that are you know not specific. But I think the big concern has always been, and and one of the things that may have affected the investment cycle. For lineage as it has for other companies looking in this space is that people have this fear that you're going to take some stem cell and inject it in the body and it's going to grow into like another like you know hip joint inside your eyeball right it's like hey we're going to regenerate your spinal cord but it's going to grow out of your ear you know and i think that's always been sort of the weird fear that people have had with this approach towards non-targeted non-differentiated um stem cell therapies which needs to be sort of pushed aside for the, you know, highly scientific and incredibly specialized work that you're doing, correct? I mean, yes, the, the, the wonderful thing about what we're doing is we manufacture what are called terminally differentiated cells. So they're, they're just like the, the, the developmental biologic process will, will turn your body into a, 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 a whole set of you know, bones and tissues and organs that, that don't revert. They don't go backwards. It's the same thing. If we manufacture retina cells, they, they cannot suddenly go back to being some sort of undifferentiated cell. They don't have that reverse capability. So We've had we've had patients who have had our cells in their in their bodies for uh, in in the eye you know two three four years. We've never had a case of rejection. We've never had a case of some strange cyst or tumor in our spinal cord program. We've got people who have had the cells in their spinal cord for over ten years, and again, not a single case of rejection or a cyst formation or a tumor. If you are Playing with undifferentiated cells, you have less control over what they become. But if you terminally differentiate cells and turn them into something else, again, that you know that's a road that you only go forward. You cannot go reverse without some sort of strange intervention. So I, I think that layers in uh, additional safety and and comfort. But it's a technical answer, and it's it's harder for the layperson on the street to really understand the distinction and what's happening on in their body. And so they need to rely on on the physician the surgeon to help them understand that. Right. So can you give the audience a little bit, just maybe like a brief sort of algorithmic approach towards what, what it is you do and how you do it and why, why we're excited about it? Yeah. So there are places in the body where we think that using and, and a transplanting a replacement cell can lead to extraordinary clinical outcomes. And our, our best example of this is in the setting of dry age-related macular degeneration, dry AMD. Um, and that's because that disease is characterized by the loss of RPE cells and, and consequently the loss of photoreceptors and loss of vision. It's a very slow age-related process where people lose their vision and it's not well understood. And people have tried different approaches to, to treat this. And for the majority of the, the last 20, 30 years, it's been wildly unsuccessful. Uh, and our approach is a little bit different. Our approach is to manufacture the replacement RPE cells, so the replacement retina cells, and transplant them in a, in a single surgical procedure. It takes about 30 minutes. Transplant them into the subretinal space to restore or replenish the RPE cells that are dying off or, or that would naturally be found there. And in doing so, we've, we've seen some really remarkable cases where people have uh, been able to regain some of the vision that they had lost and the area of atrophy has been measured at small 
smaller, even a year out or multiple years out, the area of atrophy has been smaller. And that never happens naturally. And so that's why I call it an extraordinary clinical outcome is you're, you're actually intervening in a process which should only get worse. These areas of atrophy in your eye should only get larger. And we've actually been able to replenish the area and make them smaller. And the, the, the structure, the, anat the anatomy of the retina with all of those intricate layers, um, it looks restored. It looks normalized in these areas where we've put these cells. So it's a totally new paradigm for how we could think about treating dry AMD because everyone here to four has thought that all you can do is slow it down and maybe someday we could stop it. But what lineage has been able to show in, in a handful of patients where we've, where we've uh, experienced this is that we were able to reverse that process. And that's incredibly exciting for the field. So, you know, I, I think just about everybody who would be listening to this understands that, you know, dry macular degeneration is the less talked about macular degeneration in the real world, right? Patients and, and everybody knows somebody with wet macular degeneration now who's going to their retina specialist office and having an injection of medication every six or eight or 10 weeks to sort of keep the wet macular degeneration in check. But once that process has occurred, there's really no reversing it in a healthy way. Um, ultimately, with all the treatments that we're currently using, all the um, anti-VEGF injections, as they're called, with these biologic drugs, are 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 designed to try and halt the progression um, of the disease. Dry macular degeneration has sort of been, um, you know, relegated to the world of nutritional support. Right? There have been vitamins that you know the ARIDS or ARIDS vitamins. Many people know have been shown to produce a, uh, a slowing of the process that converts dry macular generation, wet macular generation, but again, no real true um, therapeutic option for treating the permanently damaged tissue in dry AMD, which can lead to severe visual loss and often does. Recently though, there's been a change, right? So recently in the world of dry macular degeneration, there has been a product that has gotten approved. Right. So, Brian, maybe you want to tell everybody about, you know, the Apellus product and, and anything that you want to comment on that, because that's technically um, the bar that's now been set for other therapeutics to enter, I think, the space for dry AMD. Yeah, the, um, the the patient experience in dry AMD until just a couple of months ago has been you you receive your diagnosis and yeah you're told to you know take your take your vitamins and stop smoking if you're a smoker and and that's it there's nothing you can do for patients so it's very exciting for the field that a couple of months ago for the first time there's been an intervention there's a new uh, there's an injection uh, every month uh, or every other month you can get an injection of this uh, recently approved uh, therapy and what this what this therapy does is it inhibits part of the complement cascade so it's a it's an inflammatory uh, reaction in the eye and if you can inhibit this complement you can squeeze out a little bit of benefit what's really interesting tying it back to to wet amd is the the, the entire approach so in the setting of wet AMD, we really understand well what's going wrong. And that's why there are therapies that have been wildly successful in the setting of wet AMD. We know the problem, we can develop a medicine and, and target the problem and, and we can address it. In dry AMD, nobody really knows what's going wrong. But a lot of research has been focused around this one particular pathway called complement. And the theory was that if you could inhibit complement, if you could stop or slow the complement activity, you might be able to see a benefit. Um, and so the good news is that was correct. People have been able to show that if you inhibit complement, you can get a little bit of a treatment effect. The bad news is it is a vanishingly small treatment effect. Uh, you're, you're basically taking a car that's going 100 miles an hour toward the cliff of blindness, and you're slowing it from 100 miles an hour to 80 miles an hour. So if, if you wait long enough and you take enough complement every month, complement inhibitors in every month, you do begin to see evidence of a treatment effect. And that's the basis by which this new treatment has been approved, is that you can, you can imagine that if you wait long enough, if you slow process down, if process of growth or expansion, if you slow it down, if you wait long enough, that could be clinically meaningful. And so it's, it's great for the field that there's a new therapy. It's great for patients to have something to look forward to. But unfortunately, the patients don't gain any vision. 
They don't feel any differently. They just have to essentially trust that if they get six, nine, 12 injections in their eye every year, that the, the advancement of that disease is going to slow down and that, you know, eventually over time that that will be meaningfully beneficial to them. So it's, it's, it's a good announcement for the field, but it leaves an awful lot of benefit that's still on the table for, well, for companies like Lineage to try to capitalize and, and come in and, and show that there's a lot more that can be done. And that's really our approach is that we don't focus on complement. We address everything. It doesn't matter to me what's going wrong in an RPE cell because by replacing it, you're, you're basically covering everything. You're addressing complement, but you're addressing everything else all at once. And when cells are dying, there's so many things that are going wrong. And that's, that's why I think we are likely to see a bigger clinical output from our approach is that we're addressing everything in the cell, not just one narrow little area of potential deficiency. Yeah. And, 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 and again, you know, I agree as a clinician, I think that um, it's nice to have a therapeutic option. It's, and the fact that we have a first approval, I think is critical because I think that the door has now been opened and I think a lot of companies now see a real endpoint for what they have to shoot for. We know the first company through the door sort of lays a foundation for everybody else behind them and it's beneficial. But I agree with you that I think that there is going to be the opportunity for other companies to have a much more meaningful benefit. And I think that I, you know, I don't know how much it, information you want to share on your data from from your clinical trial that at least it, that, that's been published. But the data just from the patients that you've you know uh, presented and published on, it seems strikingly better already, which is really <laughs> yeah. great. So, well, you typically would see, um, you typically would see an, an area of atrophy grow one to two square millimeters every year. And that, that's, it's, it's pretty tight. I mean, it's, it's a very predictable rate of growth for, uh, for the area of atrophy in the, in the back of the eye. Um, what was, what was striking is we, we have five patients that have either um, been unchanged at 12 months or actually had a smaller area of atrophy. And again, that never happens naturally. And so you really can feel confident that it's the intervention that's leading to that change. And you, you compare that with what's out there, the best available data, you know, instead of growing, let's say, 1.5 square millimeters, they're showing that you grew that year 1.2 square millimeters. Now we've mapped this out and actually drawn what it looks like that what's a 20% reduction in growth look like after 10 years. I mean, it's vanishingly small, uh, you know, it's it really, it, but it's the only thing that's there, right? So it, it's okay. It's a place to begin for the field. It's a positive for the field. It's just you know, it's not what patients are dreaming about when they hear about a new therapy. What they're dreaming about is being able to regain vision. They're hopeful for interventions that could be one-time treatments instead of having to find a way to get someone who's vision, visually impaired and they've got to find a way to get to a clinic 12 times a year or maybe just six times a year. That's, that's very challenging for them. And again, they don't feel anything different. You know, patients want something that they can know that they're doing better. And, and when we had, we had this one surgeon who's on our clinic clinical trial and he got a phone call from a patient and she was crying and he was very worried, but she was crying because she was so happy that her vision had improved after therapy. And he's, he's talked about this publicly. It's a, it's a really wonderful story. And I've met a couple of women who have had this experience where they've had improved vision after our therapy and it's been durable, lasting multiple years. That should not happen in patients with dry MD. They should only get worse. So it really has been an exciting new approach and, you know, hopefully we'll be able to accelerate the development. And it, you know, quite notably, it led to a major pharmaceutical partnership with uh, Roche. Right. Right? So, so let's talk about that for a minute. So I think that there's a, a pretty significant um, event that occurred not too long after I took full credit for that, by the way, from my yes, podcast well in deserved. 2020, I, <laughs> I take full credit for the partnership that developed, just so you know, I mean, at least that's what I tell everybody. So you don't have to validate it publicly here, but you and I both know that it was because of me. But anyway, you and I, um, you know, conversed about the fact that there was improvement. And I think that's a pretty striking piece of information that you casually glossed over, but that people actually get better with your therapy and their vision actually improves. And it attracted the interest of several strategics. And ultimately that led to a, a partnership, which you can discuss here because everybody knows about it anyway. So. Yeah, it was uh, it, it, the BioBucks value of that partnership was $670 million. It came with a $50 million upfront fee. And one of the things that was quite notable is that 
um, cell therapy companies, right? We get lumped in. We talked about this. We get lumped in as a cell therapy company. Very few cell therapy companies, at least outside of cancer, uh, have enjoyed this kind of validating corporate partnership. So, you know, everyone says, well, why? Why Why Roche? You know, they're probably the number one company in ophthalmology. So, you know, why did they do a deal with you guys? And I think the answer is, you know, the clinical data is extra, ex- very exciting. We, we've talked about that. And then our manufacturing capability, right? We have a line of sight for how we can manufacture the, the kinds of volumes that you need and to be able to do it affordably. So, you know, you know, you don't have to think about this as like a million dollar shot the way that you, you think about that with gene therapy. So it's really, it, it's, it's been incredibly validating. I think it, it de-risks our program. It allows us to do more things with the program. And, and we really could never have launched an ophthalmology program on our own. It was just a question of when is the right time to partner. And I, I think we chose the right time because if we hadn't partnered running into the, you know, the pretty sour economy for biotech, we could have been a very distressed company. So uh, the Roche deal has been fantastic. And in, in many ways, the credibility, the cash and the capabilities that they bring, those three C's have been uh, incredibly valuable to us and, and continue. They're running another trial right now. And when that data gets announced, it, it could be extremely valuable for our business. Yeah. I mean, obviously, and we, we've talked about this, you and I, in the past as well, about you know the value of strategic intervention and when it occurs and how the timing of that has changed a little bit over the last three years. You know, it's a sort of an unprecedented economy, right? Where you have inflation, you know, at at high levels, and you have, you know, a, a supply chain that hasn't really sort of righted itself fully yet, um, and interest rates, you know, where they are, and very difficult to back test any, you know, you know, a formula is to try and figure out how we're going to come out of this, and I think people are a lot of uncertainty in the fact that you know, one of the biggest companies in in healthcare, certainly one of the biggest in ophthalmology, you know, has partnered with you in such a meaningful way, I think is incredibly validating. And I think that's, I think that's ultimately the message that, you know, carries the most weight, I think, or should carry the most weight in the investment world is that, hey, there are really, really smart people who understand what you guys have got here and what you're doing. And they, they put a significant amount of dollars behind it. And I think we're all hoping it leads to some pretty amazing, you know, therapeutic options down the road. It's not just partnership, though. Another partnership, right? I mean, I think that one of the other things that people don't really know about is, or at least get freaky about, is you know the fact that this is a surgical procedure, and certain old surgical procedures in the past, um, accessing the subretinal space. If you're anything about ophthalmic anatomy, were not, were not easy, and, and still not, but certainly challenged and significant complications because you basically had to make a hole in the retina. You know, making a retinotomy to stick something behind the retina always had the chance to lead to retinal detachment and other complications. You've got another sort of neat way to get your therapy to its targeted area, which you might want to spend a few minutes talking about. Yeah. The, um, you know, most people have never heard of lineage cell therapeutics, right? We're doing pioneering work and, and we were looking at different ways of administering the cells. So the, the conventional way of administering cells to the subretinal space is a, a vitrectomy followed by a retinotomy. And, and so, yeah, you poke a hole in the retina and you, you, you inject the cells. And, um, and for the most part, those cells are adherent and they like to, you know, kind of hang out in, in that space, but sometimes they can kind of puff back out through the hole that you formed uh, when the, the needle is retracted. So we uh, we tried a different approach. We did a license agreement for a uh, to access a, a tool um, that allows the surgeon to access the subretinal space by starting through the sclera. So you, you cut an incision through the through the sclera, um, and you you send this. Um, this uh, sheath with a micro needle all the way down and around to the back of the eye. And then you can extend that micro needle up into the subretinal space to deliver cells. And what's exciting about that is you avoid the retinotomy. So you avoid poking the little hole in the retina. Um, but it's trade-offs. As with many new techniques, it's trade-offs. So in this case, uh, one of the challenges is it's it's sort of hard to see, right? You're, you're delivering material from up underneath the eye, and it's very hard to see where you're going compared to when you're doing a retinotomy from above. It's very easy to kind of target your, your therapy. And one of the most notable findings from our clinical trial was that it was very important to deliver the cells right across the area of atrophy. That was an important, that was 100% correlated with with the best clinical outcomes. So it's really important to deliver the material. So what we have when we did the partnership is, you know, we had some, some questions about what's the best way, 
what's the right way? This is a new technology, how best and safest to deliver the cells. And that's actually the clinical trial that Roche is running right now. It's a surgical optimization clinical trial. It's going to be between 30 and 60 patients. And Roche is looking at a number of different methods and tools to try and find the best, easiest way to deliver cells. And it's illustrative of the value of this partnership. We probably couldn't have done that study. We would have chosen path A or path B and gone forward. Um, but Roche gets to dabble because they have more resources. They get to look at different things and increase the overall product profile in what I expect will be a better way. Yeah, it's 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 great to have. You know, it, it may seem, you know, to the lay person like, oh, whatever, it's still a surgical procedure, but um, to avoid, you know, vitrectomy and retinotomy is a big deal to be able to get, you know, a subretinal therapeutic in the subretinal space through a minimally, I would call it invasive procedure, you know, single incision in the sclera. Uh, I think that that in and of itself is going to, is going to be important for the future of how we get drugs to the right place. You know, the eye is such an amazing organ for therapy because we can see in it. And people may think it's gross to have an injection in your eye for macular degeneration. But the fact is, you know, you can put it right at the target and, you know, it's pretty, pretty safe and and, and pretty straightforward. You know, we can't do that with brain therapeutics or heart therapeutics. And, yeah, you know, yeah. there's a lot more complicated. So, so to be able to access these microscopically, you know, small areas in a safe way is, is critical. And I think that the technology that you've um, partnered with in order to do that is is going to be an important part of your success. So, and it's a it's a reminder of the distinction between um, stem cells, right? Undifferentiated stem cells, where people think, oh, you just squirt, squirt them into the vitreous and they'll work their magic and secrete neurotrophic factors and make the environment happy. And I, I have no idea if that works. In fact, I suspect it doesn't do anything. Um, but what we're doing is we're delivering exactly the cell that's that's dysfunctional to the anatomical location where it's needed and trying to retain it there. And that that procedure, which uh, let's call it the base case uh, of a retinotomy, that procedure is one that you know, essentially every vitreoretinal retinal surgeon ought to be able to perform, uh, or maybe they shouldn't be licensed. Um, if you do vary from that routine procedure and you go into a, a different technique, um, that may require some additional training. And so that's one of the important trade-offs is, you know, do you, are you developing a product that's going to require uh, supplemental training and, and specialized equipment? And and perhaps if it really helps, that is something you want to do, or do you want to kind of stick close to what surgeons are already pretty familiar with and a, and a procedure that they know? Um, we had elected, uh, if we if we had retained the asset on our own, we were going forward with the standard procedure. But, you know, if, if Roche finds out that there are other ways and better ways of delivering it, we're, we're going to be very happy about that. Ultimately, we want to make sure that this therapy gets to patients and as many of them as possible. Correct. Correct. And that's ultimately the, the goal here, right? It's to treat as many as you can. And, you know, I think people should also know that, you know, even though this is the OIS podcast, Lineage has got a lot of other stuff going on. You don't just work it on uh, dry macular generation. You have other areas of interest as well, because the fundamental technology that you possess can be adapted to other sort of specific disease processes, correct? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. And maybe this is a good time to just kind of insert that as a public company, uh, I may make forward-looking statements. So some people can check our risk factors on the sec.gov website. But um, we have really capitalized on the Roche agreement to uh, expand our pipeline. And so uh, my view is that it is incredibly unlikely that the only place in the human body where transplanting cells can lead to these great effects is the RPE cell in the case of dry AMD. So we have actually actually five programs right now. We have a, a second ophthalmology program where we manufacture photoreceptors. We have a, a spinal cord program, which is in the clinic right now, where we are looking to help people regain mobility by delivering oligodendrocyte cells to the spinal cord. We have a newer program that we started where we manufacture auditory neurons to help people who have hearing loss. And then lastly, we have an oncology program where we manufacture dendritic cells to help uh, the body uh, detect detect and destroy tumors. So five dis discrete, distinct, different types of cells, uh, four of which are all this replace and restore technology. And, you know, ultimately, I, I hope we have other opportunities as we grow to go into other areas and show the power of differentiated transplanted cells in clinical settings and, and hopefully beyond. Yeah, it's great. I mean, 
you know, again, I'll also make the comment that, you know, I have no financial interest in lineage cell therapeutics as an investor. I don't have any personal holdings in lineage cell therapeutics, but I'm fascinated by your company and and the way that you're approaching, you know, some of these diseases where, um, we, you know, we just haven't really had a whole lot of luck in trying to figure out ways to, to, to have an impact. And, um, you know, I applaud the progress that you make. I think that you've had significant validation, you know, from a strategic partnership. And I think everybody's looking forward to some, you know, really exciting data from you guys, not just in ophthalmology, but in other diseases. So, um, listen, Brian, I I know our time's up, but, you know, congratulations, everything that you've done so far is pretty, pretty spectacular. And it's great to see company, um, sort of move forward and, and succeed. And, you know, obviously aside from my podcast from you three years ago, I'm going to give all the other credit to you. (laughs) <laughs> um, so, you know, you know, good for you. And, you know, I'm hoping that, you know, somewhere in the near future, we'll come back and have another discussion when you have some, you know, more data to share and about, um, what we hopefully going to see as clinical products available to patients down the road. Hey, I think after Roche comes out with the, uh, the data from the ongoing clinical trial, um, you know, for better, or for worse, it's going to be a hell of a story. So, uh, yeah, this is an exciting new branch of medicine. I, I feel privileged to be a, a part of pioneering some of this work. And, and I look forward to coming back and talking about it again sometime. Yep. I can't, I can't wait. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Brian. Thank you to the OIS podcast audience. Hope you enjoyed today's discussion and looking forward to future discussions down the road.